Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome to the Superintendent Search Focus Group. My name is Michelle Anderson, and I am the Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer, and will be serving as the moderator for this focus group. We appreciate all of you for taking the time to participate in this group. At this event tonight, you'll note that we are providing space for our students, family, staff, and community members to get to know the candidate in person and ask questions. Your input is critical to helping the trustees select the best candidate for the superintendent for our schools. As you know, there are five finalists for the superintendent position, all of whom have been vetted and narrowed down by the board's appointed search firm, the Bryant Group, as well as the search advisory group selected by the Bryant Group. This evening, you will meet each finalist. First, I'll do a brief introduction for each candidate, and then they will share more about themselves and their vision. At any time during the event, you can submit your question using the card in the back, um, uh, which many of you have done already, the pink card, and you can write your questions anytime and turn them into our district staff, and I'll have them wave their hands. Um, at, they are not in here right now, but I'll have them wave their hands, um, but I'm sure you guys know who most of them are. We've also received questions submitted online before the event, so I am going to randomly select questions from there and alternate between the online and person uh, submissions to make sure we uh, are fair to those that were unable to attend. We will try to get it to as many questions as possible, but please remember we will be limited to that 30 minute time frame with each candidate. I'll read the questions to each candidate. At any point in the evening or as you meet candidates, we invite you to complete the online superintendent candidate evaluation survey. There's a flyer at the back of the room if you need uh, the link to that. Um, we have handouts for you. Uh, the survey will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, April the 22nd. Information from this evaluation survey will be provided to the Board of, the board of Trustees in advance of their selection decision at the board meeting on April 26. After 30 minutes in this room, the candidate will move on to the next room and we will bring the next candidate in. And we will do the same process for each of them. So tonight, I have with me uh, Dr. Susan Enfield. Uh, she is serving as the superintendent of Highline Public Schools in Burien, Washington. And if you would say about two minutes about yourself and then we'll start with the questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so nice to be here. Thank you for being here. I've had a marvelous day in your community. Got to visit some schools, Anderson Elementary, Billinghurst Middle School. Got a little swag from Billinghurst, which was nice as well. Um, and have just had a lovely day. Uh, as Michelle said, I am currently in my 10th year serving as superintendent for Highline Public Schools. We're a richly diverse school system just south of Seattle. And uh, after 10 years, I decided it was time for a fresh challenge and for Highline to have a fresh leader. Uh, and yet, in in spite of it all, I feel I have another superintendency left in me. And so looked very deliberately uh, about what districts were available and just felt that Washoe County was a good fit for lots of different reasons. Um, and I'm just honored to be considered and look forward to answering your questions. Great, all right, we're ready for the first one. And this one is one that was submitted in advance. Why do you want to be the next superintendent of the Washoe County School District? Okay, so I think I alluded to this before. So I, I have been a superintendent in Highline for 10 years. I was the interim superintendent for Seattle Public Schools, which is the largest district in Washington, for about 13 months before coming to Highline. And uh, the superintendency has never been easy. I think during the pandemic, though, it took it to the next level in terms of challenge. But um, it's work that I really love. And I do feel strongly that um, you need to choose your professional home wisely. And while there are lots of superintendent openings right now, there are not lots of superintendent openings that appeal to me from both the personal and professional level. And I'll speak to why I believe Washoe is that. First of all, I think um, this it's a good size district. It's not too big, it's not too small. You know, 60,000 plus students is a wonderful size. Um, it's a community that from what I have gathered a staff and community that cares deeply about its students um, and uh, advocates for them strongly. And that appeals to me as well because our students need us to be their advocates. And I will also say too that there is work that um, I have done in Highline that I think is similar to work that is being done or maybe needs to be done here. One of those is um, continuing to advocate for funding at the state level um, for students in our district. And that's work that I've done um, over the last decade uh, in Washington State. 
and, and work that I actually really enjoy and I think is critically important. Um, number two, uh, the line that the district has, every student by name and face to graduation, is actually quite similar to our Highline promise. Um, our promise in Highline, rather than a mission or vision, is to know every student by name, strength, and need, so they graduate prepared for the future they choose. Um, and that has become the DNA of our system and it drives us to know who our students are and to make sure we're preparing them for whatever path they choose for themselves after high school. That's clearly a value in this district, this community, and it's a value that I share. And finally, um, I'm at a point in my life where being close to family is more important than ever. And uh, I, have fa I have family in the Bay Area, I have family in Nevada City. Um, and just as a very, very personal side that means nothing to you, what you think of my qualifications for the job, um, my husband's happiness matters quite a bit to me. And he is an avid mountain biker. And so <laughs> geographically, uh, this area appeals to him tremendously as well. And so I will just end with this. Um, I, I think this work, doing meaningful work for students in a community takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to build trust. You have to build relationships to do this work. And I am looking to put down roots somewhere and make a home and live, lead, and serve um, a community for the years to come. That's what brings me here. Great. Uh, question number two, who is your customer? Who is my customer? Gosh, this is a conversation I've had uh, with lots of, of different folks over the years. Um, and there's different groups of customers. So clearly, we are here first and foremost to serve our students. But we can't do that without partnering with families and without supporting our staff. So you know, I, I, I've never really um, sort of been drawn to the word customer. I think it's who are the community partners that I am working with and responsible to serving. So as I said, clearly serving our students, clearly serving our families, but also making sure that our staff has what they need to do the job. Um, it's very easy to say we need to put students first. And of course we put students first. As an educator, a former high school teacher, and long time now district leader, I want to do what's best for students. But you can't do that at the, at the expense of the adults. So we have to figure out how are we creating a system where staff has have the tools and supports that they need, and families feel that they have a voice in partnering with the district, not just with me, but with the district. And I will say this, one of the things that came out of the pandemic is that when we all had to go into distance learning, I think it became really apparent really quickly how much families needed teachers and staff and how much teachers and staff needed families. And so I think that we have moved from traditional ideas of family engagement, which we used to talk about, and then pre-pandemic we would talk about partnership. But I think what has come out of the pandemic and what I want to build upon is what I've called hashtag team kid. Every child is deserving of a team that consists of their family and their school staff working together for their success. And that I think is, I guess together I would say is the adults, our customer, even though I didn't like, like that word, but our primary focus is our children. So working together in service as our kids as the adults. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, you found the job at San Diego uh, appealing because the district has stable leadership, including long serving board members, and you like that the last superintendent stayed for eight years. Mm -hmm. How does this district appeal to you since superintendents are coming and going and the board is not that of a long standing serving members? That's a great question. It's a really good question. I'm going to think about that for a minute. So, yes, clearly I've been very clear that longevity and stability matter for me. And they don't matter for me just because of my own personal and professional happiness and well being but they matter for me in terms of the ability to get the work done. And as someone in the media asked me, there are lots of different reasons why, um, why superintendents leave, why we have turnover. And I can't speak to all of the reasons why former superintendents weren't here, but I can tell you this. Um, the fit between superintendent, candidate, board, and community has to be there. You can't manufacture it, you can't force it. It's there or it's not. And and if, and if I believe that, that if I am the right fit, that we will be able to work through challenges together. Um, and if I come, and I would come, fully committed to being here, this isn't a stepping stone. I'm not as young as I look. Um, and so <laughs> I'm really looking, that was a joke. I, I've aged in dog years during the pandemic. But, um, but I will say that I really am looking to put, in, to put down roots and be somewhere for some time. And that means getting through the tough times together. It won't always be easy. Um, there will be disagreements. There will be challenges. But I believe that if, if the fit is right from the outset and we all go into it eyes wide open with a shared commitment to moving forward together, we'll get through the disagreements. We'll get through the tough times and we'll be able to move forward as a community. Great. 
Will you ensure CRT will not be indoctrinated to our students? Will you not take political sides? So there's two questions there. One is about CRT and the other is about taking political sides. I'll take the CRT question first because we get this question in Highline as well. And um, I think that, so we do not teach CRT uh, in our schools in Highline. I don't believe it's taught here. Now, I do think there are topics that are of concern to some people that they are sort of putting under the CRT umbrella. So what we've tried to do in Highline is have conversations um, with folks who have questions and concerns to really find out what is it the nature of the concern? What is it about CRT or your understanding of CRT that concerns you? And, and what do you think or what have you heard or what have you seen or what have you experienced that's happening in our schools that's given you that concern so that we can address that. So I think this is just where we have to keep the, the sort of the dialogue open and not shut down and not just say, okay, this is what I believe I'm not going to engage. And so I've really um, made it a point of listening and really trying to listen to understand and get to the bottom of it. But CRT isn't taught in our schools. I don't believe it's taught here. But there are legitimate concerns that people who are, who are asking about that have. And we have to dig deep about what those real concerns are and not keep it at the super level, the superficial level of CRT. There's more there. So let's unpack that and let's figure out what that is. Because school is not a place of indoctrination. We're there to educate, not indoctrinate. That's incredibly important. Secondly, when it comes to taking political sides, so being a superintendent, um, so I bow down to people who run for office. I could never do it. And yet, I think I've chosen a profession that's probably about as political as any job can be without running for office, right? That's the nature of being, an, especially an urban superintendent. Um, so this is what I have always said, and I had this conversation actually um, with one of the trustees today. Um, I do not take political sides. I don't, even, even when I have good friends running for office, I don't support anybody's campaign. I am very, very clear that my job as superintendent supersedes my personal politics. And for me to take a side could come back to hurt the district. And I won't do that. So my politics come second to my responsibility as superintendent. Now I want to be clear, that does not mean that I will not advocate strongly for our children and take a stand on issues that I believe impact our children and families. But there is a difference between being an advocate and taking a stand and getting political. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, next question. How would you plan to reduce the achievement gap between our English learners and the native English speaking students? It's a wonderful question. So um, I am uh, a former ELL teacher. I taught high school for seven years. I taught, um, our, I taught our newcomer students. So I had upwards of 12 languages in my classroom at any given time. So this is a, a population that is near and dear to my heart. And uh, I would say that in Highline, our team has done some pretty extraordinary work at making sure that our students who are newly, who are newly arrived and for whom English is very, very new, um, get that intensive English support they need, but that, we, but that we make sure that we include them in the larger school setting as much as possible. So we've really worked to not keep students separate or segregated from others and give them the language support that they need, and that's been quite successful. So I, I think it's it's striking that balance between giving them you know, the instruction they need to get the basics in English, but then really immersing them in their school community so that they feel a part of their school community, and so that they're learning the language in context of interacting with their peers, with their teachers, with others. Um, and that's gone a long way for us. Um, I would be keen on learning what uh, is working here for students for whom English is a different language and what the concerns are about what was, you know, are there, are there not good curriculum materials? Do our teachers not have the support that they need? Are we not partnering maybe with families in the same way that we'd like to to find out what they think is missing in terms of their children achieving more? So I would come in and do a lot of listening and learning, bringing some of my experience to bear as well. Great. Uh, next question, do you believe all WCSD curriculum for grades K through 12 should be posted for parent review? If yes, why or why, if no, why not? All of our curriculum is public. There is no secret curriculum that I'm aware of in any school system. Um, I will say that I think sometimes there's a perception that a curriculum exists when it really doesn't. And I'll give you an example. So uh, one of my uh, local city council members in Highline has submitted a request for our SEL curriculum. Um, we don't have a curriculum per se. We have resources that we use. We have tools that we use. So what we're going to do is sit down and sort of share what we have. Um, um, there's no secret here. There's no hiding. And I think that um, 
over the past few years, um, seeds of mistrust have really been sown in our community. And uh, it's, I think, very easy, uh, just human nature, because we're all human, to get defensive and to want to hunker down and retreat when really what we need to do is lean in and open up and say, what do you want to know? <laughs> we'll share it. I mean, frankly, the, the curriculum materials can't be a secret because we have adoption committees that are made up of students, of families, of community members. You know, they're the ones who look at the materials before the board even considers adopting them. So it's all public from the get-go, um, and there's no reason not to keep it public moving forward. So I can't see any reason that there wouldn't be that opportunity. Great, thank you. Uh, what will you do to lead the district in significantly improving the early literacy skills of children so they are reading at grade level by the end of third grade? Yeah, that's a great question. And saw some really, had a great conversation um, with uh, Mike, the, the principal at Anderson today. Um, I'm a huge proponent, God bless you. Um, I'm a huge proponent of, of early learning, have been um, for most of my career, especially over the last decade. And I'm a big believer that um, investing in high quality pre-K, high quality um, full day kindergarten, and making sure that you're creating a continuum up through third grade and beyond, by the way, it doesn't end after third grade, um, is the only way that we're gonna have a chance at preventing gaps from starting in, in the first place, if they all have that solid foundation. Uh, I will say that we are um, seeing, and, and I had a conversation with some staff today in your school, I think that we have, um, especially our first and second graders, have lost some ground over the pandemic. Um, you know, students at all grade levels, I think depending on who they were, had, you know, unique challenges. But what we're seeing at first and second grade, because they missed out on some of those fundamental basic skills, we're having to double down on the, the supports that we put there. But the beauty that I saw today was our kindergartners, they didn't miss a beat. I was sat down and talked with a little one today who was writing a story about the weather and how she loved to play in the rain and she had written that out and she read it to me with pride. And so that five-year-old brain is a wondrous thing. So I think it's making sure that we're capitalizing on what we know is really good instruction, pre-K and K, and obviously I will advocate for more pre-K because I don't think universal pre-K is here yet. We have universal full day K, but we need universal pre-K. Um, but I think that the more we invest in that P3 continuum, and I see it as a P3 continuum, so when I came to Highline, we didn't really have a, an early learning focus. And so one of the first things I did was um, secure some funding to hire a P3 director so that we were creating a continuum of, of partnering with our pre-K providers and making sure that there was a continuum K123. So it's giving teachers a lot of professional learning opportunities. Um, having We have wonderful teachers in our district who've um, created demonstration classrooms where they open up their practice for others to come in and learn. We've partnered with our pre-K providers. We'll, where we will provide Saturday sessions so that they don't have to shut down their, their um, daycare or pre-K during the week. They can come on a Saturday and we share what we're doing. So we're building some alignment between um, what is happening in those pre-K settings and what's happening in the district and finally engaging our families really early. So we started what we called our pre-K play and learn because we want our parents and families to be partners from day one with us in this work, especially when they're so little. And so um, before our, our pre-K students and our K students come in, the families can come in, we have activities we share with them, resources that they can use with their students, and that's been incredibly powerful for building those relationships. So I think it's it's you know really high quality materials, learning what the research tells us those, those wonderful young minds can do, investing in our teachers and partnering with families, but knowing that those early years are critical to the success of our students later on. Great. Uh, this one's a little long, um, so bear with me. Um, in Nevada, our Department of Education and Washoe County School District have chosen to focus on equity over education, which has resulted in high graduation rates, masking low proficiency rates, 47% proficient in English language arts and 23 in math, and equity using restorative practices creating unsafe schools. How will your continued focus on equity better prepare students to be college and or career ready? So there's a lot in there, and I'm gonna to try to unpack as much as I can and answer as much as I can there. So um, first of all, I, I think that um, the term equity has come to mean very different things to different people. 
And one of the things that I've had lots of conversations about recently, both with superintendent colleagues, but also with parents, family members, um, community members, are what are we really getting at when we talk about equity? And really what we're getting at is making sure that every student has what they need to be successful. So I'm going to go back to my Highline promise. Um, that promise to know every student by name, strength, and need, so they graduate prepared for the future they choose, not a future that was predetermined for, for them by lack of access to opportunity or what have you. That's the best definition of equity I can think of. And there isn't a parent or family member I've met who doesn't say that's what I want for my kid. I want to know that my, my child is showing up to school every day and somebody knows them well and they know what they're good at, so they're building their confidence and their resilience. They know where they need help and they're investing in that. And they're making sure that they're on a pathway to success post-graduation. Now, I think the bigger question, so we can look at proficiency rates, they're incredibly important. The data is incredibly important. I also think we have to, though, look at um, what are our students doing after they graduate? The proof is in the pudding there. It's ultimately how successful are our students on whatever post-secondary path they, that they've chosen for themselves. That's what I really want to find out. Where have, our, where have, we, where have we not um, done a good job in preparing our students for that path that they've chosen for themselves? So, so for me, um, looking at the data, having conversations um, with staff, with families, and with students around you know, what is it going to take? Um, and remembering, too, that test scores matter mightily. And they are one measure. They're one measure. There are lots of other measures, too, that we need to take into consideration. And so I won't shy away from conversations around equity, but I think I would challenge us to be open to perhaps a different definition of that from maybe what, what we've heard. And one of the things I talk about now is belonging. Who doesn't want their child to feel a sense of belonging and connectedness in school? And every child is different. And every child needs something different. And our job in the school system is to make sure that your child and your child and your child come to school and feel that sense of belonging and support and are ultimately successful. Great. Convince me you can get 8,000 staff to enthusiastically follow you and your past experience doing this. Oh, geez. It has to be enthusiastically, huh? OK. All As right. Staff member, yes. um, <laughs> Well, so here's, here's what I will say. Um, first of all, as I said, I love this work. This is the work of my life. Um, and I also love people, which helps. It helps to be an extrovert when you're a superintendent. Um, and I think that being accessible as a superintendent is very important. And figuring out what are what is it that, that galvanizes this community. So when I first came to Highline, and I would do the same here, um, should that happen, is really going out and, and talking to people and listening. What is it that you care deeply about here? What is it, what is it that drives you? What is it that makes this community special, right? And I'm not saying just tell, don't tell me all the pretty stuff. I want to hear the concerns too. But what is it that binds us together? We spend so much time right now focusing on what drives us apart. But what is it that binds us together as a community in support of our children? And in Highline, that manifested itself in, in the development of our Highline promise. And when I say that promise, like those aren't just words on paper. That has become the DNA of our system. You can't go anywhere in Highline where people don't say, you know, this is what it means to know every student by name, strength, and need. And I really knew that we had hit something when they started using it against me in board meetings. And I'll never forget the first night someone said, that's not knowing every student by name, strength, and need. And of course, it was like a gut punch, right? Like, I left the meeting, and I'm like, oh. And my chief communications officer said, no, this is good. This is good. It means that they know that we're, that we're serious about this, and they're holding us accountable to it. So I think finding what those values are that resonate with people and being very, very clear that that's what's going to drive your decisions. I mean, that promise, we led with that. Every webinar we did on PPE and social distancing and hybrid, we led with that promise. So uh, what's the shared why? What's our shared why? And how even, especially when we disagree, do we come back to that? And the other thing I would say is finding opportunities to get out and build relationships and get to know you. So I shared this, I think, in my interview. Some of you may have heard it. Um, one of the things that I did that I think is, was really effective as a new superintendent was I held um, office hours. And that could be for community or staff. Anybody could sign up to come to meet with me for 15 minutes. And I would set aside a certain number of hours each month. And people would come into the office, and we'd just chat. 
What's on your mind? Sometimes they just wanted to meet me. Sometimes they had a, a, an issue or a problem. Sometimes they just wanted to chat. But you know, it was it was sort of their time. And I also make a point of being out in schools on a regular basis. I think you can't ask people um, to follow you if you aren't willing to walk alongside them. And so as a superintendent, I work very, very hard to be accessible, um, to be someone that staff feels is um, not their boss, but their colleague. Yes, ultimately, I'm responsible for, for holding people accountable to do right by our kids. But I hope that they see me as someone who believes in them, who appreciates them. And I think creating a culture of appreciation, this work is hard. And it's gotten harder over the last couple of years. And so finding ways to celebrate staff and let them know that their work matters. And I'll give one quick example, and I know we're almost out of time, but um, just as a personal aside, my father calls me Duck. Nobody knows why, he can't remember. I don't know if I quacked, I waddled, I did something. But I'm a 53-year-old woman, and if my father walked in here right now, he'd say Duck. So um, you know, I actually have little rubber ducks that I have printed our Highline Promise, every student by name, strength, and need. And for the last eight years, staff can nominate other staff for a Ducky Award. And it's people who are going above and beyond for our kids. And I will tell you, when I take that little yellow piece of rubber out to a staff member and give it to them, it reduces people to tears. And it's not the duck. It's they feel seen. They feel appreciated. And so how do we get people to move in one direction together? We make sure they feel seen. They feel appreciated. And by the way, they feel heard, even when what you need to hear isn't easy, because that's leadership. OK, I think we're going to be able to have time, hopefully, for one more question and a closing. You spoke mostly about restorative justice in your interview. Mm -hmm. You focused on the loss of learning for the defiant students and their social emotional states. But what happens to the rest of the children and the teachers who've had to deal daily with the disruptive students? What about their learning loss? I removed my son from Reno High School due to the fact that he said it took the teacher 20 minutes daily to get control of the room. The students decided when it was time to learn. Do you think all students should sign a code of conduct so every student knows what is expected of them and know what the consequences are? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're right. Every student who walks into that classroom is equally deserving of access to their education. And one particular student shouldn't be responsible for, den for denying others that. I have a responsibility as superintendent to make sure that every student has access to their learning. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for bad behavior. That doesn't mean that we don't remove a student from the class, even temporarily, if we need to. But I also have to be mindful of not denying a student because of whatever they are dealing with from from continuing with their education and ultimately getting a diploma. These are hard situations. Um, and I had a, a long conversation with a, a trustee about this as well. Um, there are no, um, every situation is unique. And so I will give you an example of something that, while I definitely do believe in the fact that out of school suspension and expulsion, while necessary for the safety of students and staff, and while we still do that in Highline, it shouldn't be the go-to. That shouldn't be the first resort when someone is acting up or acting out, that we just say, we're going to push you out. We should try some other things first. Um, and we should put the supports in place for, for teachers in the classroom to be able to do that. And I think we also have to be realistic. I will tell you that over the past several years, in all of this talk about discipline and changing approaches to discipline, I've, I've heard people across the country say, we're putting a moratorium on, on suspensions K-3. We never put a moratorium on anything at any grade level. Because as much as it breaks my heart, I have seen a five-year-old clear a classroom. It's heartbreaking. That child is going through something really profound. They're punching holes in walls. They're overturning furniture. It's putting the rest of the class at risk. Do we need to remove that child temporarily to figure out what's going on so that the rest of the class can come back and learn safely? Yes. And we deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. So I share that example to say you can't make blanket statements. You can't make blanket proclamations. I think it really comes down to a value. And the value is that we want to create learning environments where students feel respected and connected and safe. And so, as I said also, you know, looking at discipline rates, that's a metric of the greater school culture. So when you talk about a code of conduct, I absolutely think that every child and adult in a school building should be very clear on what their value system is and what is the way of being in that school. Here's our, you know, our, our way our code, whatever it is. But yes, this is how we treat people here. This is how we treat one another here. When we do this, we're going to call people on it and, and do something. And I know we're out of time. Sorry, I could keep going. I'm going to stop. 
<laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, I, I was gonna give you a minute, but you get 30 seconds oh, 30 <laughs> to wrap seconds. up and say any closing comments, because I wanna make sure we stay on time and we get the next sure. candidate in. I just wanna thank you all for giving up your time, for submitting the questions. Um, the fact that you're here means you care deeply about uh, your community and the children in the school district, so thank you. And it's been an honor to be in your community today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Enfield. Um, and we thank all of you guys for listening uh, with this uh, candidate. We're gonna have our staff member take you to the next. Take a quick two minute break for the next candidate to come in. If you have more questions that you wanna fill out, um, uh, please fill them out and I will go through these questions again. And then our next candidate that is coming up is uh, Joan Ebert.
Attendant Search Focus Group. My name is Michelle Anderson, and I am the Chief Communications Officer, uh, and Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer, and will be serving as moderator for this focus group. We appreciate all of you taking the time to participate in this focus group. At this event tonight, you'll note that we have been providing space for our students, families, staff, and community members to get to know the candidate in person and ask them questions. Your input is critical to helping the trustees select the best candidate for the superintendent of our schools. As you know, there are five finalists for the superintendent position, all of whom who have been vetted and narrowed down by the board's appointed search firm, the Bryant Group and as well as the search advisor group selected by the Brian group. This evening you will meet each finalist. First I'll do a brief introduction of each candidate and then they will share more about themselves and their vision. At any time during this event you can submit your questions using the pink card that's located in the back and you can write your questions anytime and turn them in to one of our district staff members um, and they'll raise their hand in the back. We have also received questions submitted online before the event, so I'll select which questions to read at random and try to alternate between those online and in person so that everybody gets a fair share. We will also try to get to as many questions as possible, but please remember we will be limited on time, so we will not get to every question. And again, I'll read those questions to each candidate. At any point in the evening or as you meet candidates, uh, we invite you to complete the online superintendent uh, evaluation survey. You can find the survey by scanning the QR code that's included on the flyer in the back. Uh, we have handouts available here. The survey will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, April 22nd. Information from this evaluation survey will be provided to the board in advance of their selection decision at the board meeting on April 26th. After 30 minutes in this room, the candidate will move on to the next room and we'll bring the next candidate in. We'll do the same process for each. So tonight, we have Ms. Joan Ebert, our uh, Nevada State Superintendent of Public Instruction. And Ms. Ebert, if you would give about a minute, um, just two or two minutes, just to kind of introduce yourself and then we'll get to the questions. Good evening, how is everyone? Great, okay, so it's a big night. Determination of the of the superintendent for the Washoe County um, School District, which I'm excited to be a finalist. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, um, 30 almost over 30 years in Nevada. Very proud of the work that has transpired, uh, especially the last three uh, as state superintendent and during the work during the pandemic. I really three things I would share with you this evening. Engage, empower, and explore. And engage means intentional engagement, that we reach out and that we have two-way communication early and often. Empower students, families, community. Empowering means partnership in the work. It means inclusion in the work. As we work shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, the only way we're gonna get better faster is to make sure that we have two-way communication, that we lift each other up, that we can agree to disagree at times, but that we focus on our children and what they need to become productive citizens. And then finally, exploring. I think the pandemic gave us the opportunity to think differently about how we do the business of education. Uh, up until the time of the pandemic, a lot of our classrooms still had chairs, rows, which were early, you know, 1900s, over 100 years, uh, the same lines and rows in some of our classrooms. And what we learned is that our classrooms actually can be in homes. It's not ideal as we learned in um, some instances, uh, but bringing the classroom into the homes has been uh, critical. I thank you, those of you that are parents, uh, for what you've done uh, to lift up and work alongside the educators who were doing double duty with hybrid, hybrid classrooms um, and that work. So thank you for having me here tonight and I'm ready for it. Let, let's right, do the questions. Let's do this. All right, first question. Why do you want to be the next superintendent of the Washoe County School District? I thought long and hard about um, before putting in the application. If you, if you haven't gone on to the web, you need to, to see all the information that was asked. As I shared with media earlier, I think the only thing that I wasn't asked about is my blood type. Um, but everything else is there. 
Uh, I am a 32-year educator, and I've been the state superintendent for the last three years, and I've loved the work. I am not running away from anything. I love my job. Uh, and working with all 17 superintendents as well as the state public charter school authority. What I miss is being with family, being with students, being with teachers on a regular basis. Uh, being boots on the ground, working alongside, leading in a different way. I am really excited uh, to do that. Also, too, in northern Nevada, we have a lot of opportunity at this point in time with the diversification um, of northern Nevada. There are great economic opportunities, opportunities for our students, and we need to make sure that they're prepared. Uh, to enter and engage in those, whether it's higher education, the military, um, or directly into the workforce. And I'm, I'm excited to build out uh, with the team here in Washoe County School District for our students. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, will you ensure CRT will not be indoctrinated to our students? Will you not take political sides? I am nonpartisan in my job each and every day. CRT is not taught in our classrooms. If it is, and I say that as um, state superintendent as well as a candidate, um, if you believe that it is taught in our classrooms, then I, I would like to know specifically where and when. If you've studied and looked at that work, um, it is college work, college level discussion, um, and it is not a K-12, it is not in our standards in Nevada, and there is no expectation um, in our classrooms for CRT. Thank you. Uh, what is the most important asset in an organization like this school district? Wow, that's a good question. I have not, um, wow. It, uh, the ass, our children, number one, our children are our assets. Our children are our future. Uh, the people that work within the organization and lift up our students every single day. Um, we are people-driven work, organization, community. Uh, but we come to work for our children. So uh, children, absolutely. Great. Now, bear with me. This is a little bit of a long one. Uh, our family's experience with technology in the classroom has not been positive. Our sixth grade student does not possess the self-discipline to stay focused during classroom instruction because of his computer access. Upon viewing his computer history, it is evident that during classroom instruction, he is distracted with participation in email strings, gaming, and watching YouTube videos. He uses his headphones and his activity goes unnoticed by his teachers. Despite distractions, he is able to maintain an AB average because he can easily Google search the answers to nearly all questions in all subjects. Additionally, because the devices go home with the students, many households do not contain filters on their home networks, allowing children access to sites that should not be accessed. Parents are unable to change controls on the devices themselves because they are school property. Lastly, the overall education seems compromised because teachers are no longer teaching from their own lesson plans, but simply using pre-made tut tutorials. The students no longer have textbooks, all text materials scanned into the computer. Research shows that screen time is harmful to our children, and yet we are subjecting them to hours on the computer daily. I believe the board really needs to take a deeper look at the technology policies. Uh, this particular family spends about $300 a month for math tutoring um, just to go through their le uh, regular classwork. So there isn't a question, but what's your thoughts on this, I would say? So what the question or how the person is I mean, obviously, well, number one, thank you for being deeply involved in your child's um, experience in education. Um, you obviously have spent quite a bit of time uh, researching and understanding what is transpiring. And number two, what I would say, for those of you that have not uh, had the opportunity to read uh, my bio, I did start the virtual high school um, in Southern Nevada. In 2000, well, it actually initially started it in 1996. There was um, time when states across um, the United States were looking to require online learning as part of graduation requirements. 
I was not on that bandwagon, and here is why. Not all children, even the principal of virtual high school wearing that hat, right, leading the virtual high school is saying it is not for every child. It is not. And so I was actually asked by the legislature at that point in time, you know, should we require it, legislators? Um, and I said, absolutely not. Uh, because, and as we've learned too with the pandemic, there are some students that thrive with the on and families that thrive with the online learning. But it's not just like um, uh, medicine, uh, you know, people may have high cholesterol, but they all are assigned different types of medicine because of what works with who you are in your body. And that's really what we need to look at when we're looking at education. Uh, in the department, we're also uh, doing personalized competency-based learning, not just can you go who Googles the best, um, but really looking at, much like this search, what are the competencies that a student has, what are the competencies that a, a superintendent has or a candidate has, and can they meet and demonstrate success? And until a student can demonstrate that success, they would not move on, on to the next level. Um, so number one, thank you um, to the person that wrote that question. Uh, number two, learning environment is critical. Finding, uh, making sure that our expectations for our students, they have authentic learning experiences. Um, Project-based, hands-on, those type that we're asking the different levels of questions for our students so that they are engaged and it isn't, um, you know, uh, like growing up of, you know, what's the, who's, where's the capital of Nevada? Um, we want to make sure that students understand much more than just can, what they can find online. Great. I want to know how the superintendent plans to make Washoe County schools better. I feel like education in Nevada is really lacking to keep students motivated. Teachers aren't teaching, standards seem to be low compared to schools in other states. Kids need motivation to do well to see the big picture. COVID really caused a lot of kids to lose their drive to do well. They feel like the world is going to end and school doesn't matter. How do we make school matter again? That's a great question. Uh, as I mentioned with personalized competency-based learning and the opportunity that we have right now, student voice and family voice is, is critical. I have students on uh, several of the committees what is it that is transpiring within our classroom or is not is not transpiring within our classrooms why you know we need to ask our customer why are you not engaged um, and find out uh, what is driving our students i will tell you i'm a huge fan of career and technical education uh, 100 percent if you look it's something that we do but for some reason we haven't doubled down on it enough but we have this opportunity at, uh, right now to do so 92 percent graduation rate students that participate in career and i'm not saying you know old vocational tech that's not what i'm saying cte you can participate in, in career and technical education and take AP courses. That is possible and that ha happens in our schools and it needs to happen more and more. Um, and so the student engagement, when they can see a career path, when they understand what college expectations are, they are more engaged. Uh, again, the pandemic happens. Uh, we have some things that we need to make sure social emotional things are taken care of as well. Uh, but we have an opportunity at this point in time to expand uh, those areas which have shown uh, high, high rates of graduation. Great, thank you. Uh, you state you came from a childhood of poverty. Do you feel your success can be attributed to your hard work and perseverance? Do you believe in mediocrity? I believe my success is because, I know my success, not just believe, I know my success is because of educators. Teachers did not look at me as a child that is disheveled, as a child that grew up in a thousand square feet with seven people in one shower and said, oh my goodness, she doesn't have some place to study. They said, we are going to enroll her in algebra, we're going to enroll her in physics, we're gonna make sure that she has the, the resources that she needs. They saw me as an asset. 
She's gonna have the resources that she needs to be successful. My parents did not have, they did not um, go to college. They didn't know how to fill out a college application. They didn't know about Pell Grants. They loved me. My parents loved me, but they did not know how to support me into success in a career. But the educators did, and they wrapped their arms around myself, my sister. My sister is now an endowed chair at the University of California at Irvine. I mean, phenomenal success because of educators, and that is why I come back every single day to work to make sure I can model after those that supported me so that we can be successful. My, my son did not qualify for Pell Grants, um, didn't qualify for those pieces of, of grants that I had to take advantage of because I had a job, was able to pay full college tuition, um, and it, it, when we have a system of supports, um, for those that don't understand how to work a system, we can get success for every single child. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask this question, and I apologize in advance to the person who wrote it because I want to paraphrase a little bit so I can get to the question and move on to other questions. So as the Nevada Department of Education Superintendent of Public Instruction since 2019, there is a track record regarding placing demographically driven equity as the focus of Nevada's education policy. What we in the community see and is documented by Nevada Report Card when equity is the focus over education we get, and they list three parts. High graduation rates, around 83%, that in reality only masks that our schools are graduating students, 47 proficiency in English language arts, and 23% proficiency in math. We also get, uh, we also get um, when we place equity over safety, uh, through restorative practices, and they give an example of Clark County, and I won't go into that just because we're Washoe County, but they obviously have a high number of confiscated firearms, assaults, batteries, and fights. Um, and they have a mass exodus of seasoned teachers, which we um, obviously saw in last night's WCSD budget discussion. So based on all of that, can you please explain to me how a continued focus on equity over paying teachers and having smaller classes will help safely educate our students to be college and or career ready. So first and foremost, what I would say, it's not an either or. And I think the way, um, and I don't know who, you know, but I'd love to have, continue to have a conversation. It's, it's not an either or, it's an and. Our, our teachers um, across the entire state, absolutely, pay needs to be increased, 100%. I am, I am there, not only, excuse me, not only for the teachers, but for all of, of uh, the employees within the school district. Um, we know that uh, generating revenue in our state uh, Someone asked me earlier if we were going to, to have um, income tax in Nevada, and I said, I do not believe so as long as, as all of us are alive. But we also, we're trying to hold two things in our head. We want to pay more, but we also have to think about, yes, pay more. How, where's the revenue coming from? And so we, as a community, need to make that determination and the Commission on School Funding is looking at exactly that. How do we get to optimal funding? Many of you know I spent four years in New York. $24,000 per child is the funding in New York. When we talk about equity, $9,000, $10,000 per child in Nevada. Our children are competing against children that have 150% more than our children do. That is an equity issue. So it is not an either or, it is how we merge the two to be able to move forward. And so working together, it is not, this work is not a one person job. If you're expecting to have a one person solve all the problems, that is not going to solve all your problems. It's the superintendent with the school board, with the community, parents, engagement, 
each and every day, adults being in the schools, understanding, going back to the person that wrote earlier, that, that parent is engaged. Knowing what your ch child is involved with um, is huge. Uh, and so, again, my own personal story, uh, because equity in the school system that I grew up in was part of the success there, it can definitely be part of the success in Washoe County School District as well. Great, um, we've got about five minutes, so hopefully we get a couple Already. more in. How would you plan to reduce the achievement gap between our English learners and the native English speaking students? Achievement gap, well, first of all, we need to look at all of our students and the languages that they bring as assets. Um, wouldn't it be nice if all of our children, like many across the globe, could speak multiple languages? multiple languages, all of our children. Um, and so looking at, at what transpires in other countries to make sure, not waiting like what's happened with me, right? I took two years of French in high school. We know brain development and language development happens when, we're, when they're toddlers, right? And so working early on in the development and making sure that we can graduate multilingual um, students is, is something that we should look at as a community. Great. Uh, what will you do to lead the district in significantly improving the early literacy skills of children so they are headed, so they are reading at grade level by the end of third grade? Read by grade three. Um, the data there is uh, phenomenal and that was started um, under uh, Governor Sandoval at the time. That program and the resources and um, being laser focused on what our expectations are uh, showed great gains. We need to continue in that realm. If there are teachers that need additional supports to support the children, we need to make sure they have those resources. Uh, but doubling down on early learning, uh, PK th uh, through third grade, um, when the children are developing those language skills, we will see great success. We can't give up on what we've seen as good practice. Um, as we see our dem uh, demography change, we know our data will change as well, but we need to make sure that we provide those supports for student success. Great. I know I'm, I'm checking the time, sorry. I'm making <laughs> oh, no, sure I'm staying okay. on time. Um, Try to get as many in there. Convince me you can get 8,000 staff to enthusiastically follow you um, and your past experience doing this. Enthusiastically, I love it, I love it. Well, if you are not um, a staff member, uh, what I, I, I'm very big on communication. I'm very big on two-way communication. And so what I started as the state superintendent is emailing directly, quarterly, to everyone that has a license. Um, and I've asked them to reach out to me uh, when they have questions to celebrate uh, their work. And so lifting up, celebrating, valuing um, our educators, I think that would bring us to uh, enthusiastic work together uh, for student success. Great, and with about uh, two minutes left, um, give, in about one minute, give me a minute to, um, uh, for your closing comments, anything that you want to say um, as you're wrapping up. Okay, I'm just kidding. I apparently can't tell time. <laughs> I'm going to go with the next question because I thought it was six o'clock. Okay, I uh, apologize for that. In Nevada, our Department of Education and Washoe County School District have chosen to focus on equity over education, which has resulted in high graduation rates. Um, did I read this one? I think that was from the previous one, but um, we'll go to the next one. Thank you, everybody. Um, as a superintendent, how would you describe your role in spe special education for the district? Special education um, across our state, first and foremost, I think it was important to uh, get the funding formula right uh, so that we can fund uh, special education appropriately. It is still not funded appropriately. A lot of uh, the requirements with IDEA, um, I've worked with those that are uh, our elected officials 
uh, at the federal level, uh, you have several uh, people that are huge advocates of making sure that IDEA for our special education students, those of you that are not aware, that uh, the, f the funding comes in and that the children are supported. Uh, there are several programs um, here in Washoe County School District uh, where we've seen great success. The Nevada Department of Education, along with the Washoe County School District staff, have um, provided resources uh, so that students, we have students that have entered their own business. We actually at the department hired a special education student to be a videographer. Uh, during uh, some time when we needed some work done. So there, we need to make sure that those success stories um, are happening in every single one of our schools. Great, thank you. Um, do you think parents should be the ones to teach their children about sex, or do you think schools should? We in Nevada have the opportunity for parents to opt out of uh, sex education, so they are the ones uh, that are, are working with their children. Um, that has been in place for a very long time. I will tell you that's one area uh, where uh, learning online Early on in my career, when I did curriculum and instruction, the families um, that wanted to teach their children but didn't have all of the resources that they needed to go through that instruction, they signed up for the online class because then they had their child sign up for the online class in this section. So they had the materials and the resources and they could work um, directly with their child. So it was still content that was provided by the school district, parents and it was kind of family learning, right? Engaging in, in that component. Um, and so that's how we move forward uh, with sex education. Thank you. What are the two to three specific markers that truly tell whether the district is getting the job done? So when I look at the data um, and I think about the future, one uh, that I talked about so that we can become uh, better and have more engaged students. We talked about it earlier, uh, career and technical education. Also two, uh, chronic absenteeism right now in the Washoe County School District is an issue. Um, we need to address that if children are not in school uh, learning, they're, they're not having that opportunity to learn. Uh, so that needs to be addressed um, as well. But I was speaking to someone earlier about um, school districts within states that are recognized. I think about several school districts back east, a lot of people talk about Massachusetts. The whole entire community is involved in the education system. The community owns the schools, the community lifts up the schools, and it is perpetuated as a positive environment and those areas where, they're, where school districts can excel and become better, parents and community lean in. It's not about finger pointing. Right? How, if there are issues, how do we all work together to solve those issues? Um, and one of my goals would be to make sure that the Washoe County School District is put on the map nationally for its work. We have, or we're competing for workforce, as someone um, noted earlier in their question. One way to do that is actually to um, start to participate in what's called the TUDA, T-U-D-A, Tribal Urban District Assessment, um, and that would compare us to other school districts across the nation that are our size, that are large school districts. Uh, there are 25 school districts across the United States that already participate in that. Washoe County School District is larger than five of those school districts and does have higher educational attainment than those school districts as well, and they're all over the United States. And so communication on what we do well as the Washoe County School District 
and I know you do communication, so thank you for what you do, you know, I, I, for amplifying it, and that's what I would do as superintendent. Like, are there other resources that you need in the communication department uh, to, <laughs> well, to help amplify, right? To help amplify and lift, because a lot of times when we have finger pointing or there's misinformation, it's because there's a communication breakdown. And, and that continuation of what we do well, I'm not afraid of what we're not doing well right now, so let's talk about it and then let's work together to fix it. Great, okay, now we're at the one minute left. Uh, so give me one minute to wrap up your closing arguments, um, maybe a little less than one minute. Okay, well thank you again for everyone being here. Uh, most of you know I am a, I'm, I am a Nevadan. Uh, working in this state is very unique. Uh, we have 17 school districts. We're very tight as superintendents working together and lifting it up. We also know we're very unique that uh, small government, right, 120 days is when our legislature meets and gets the business of the state done. Um, and those dynamics, uh, definitely, I've seen the candidates, they're great qualified candidates. I, I would not um, uh, say anything different because I've seen their resumes as well. But what I would say is when you have um, candidates that are similar and have very um, range of experiences, uh, you add in the Nevada component that definitely places in my mind uh, that I would suit the Washoe County School District and the community extremely well uh, for being selected as the next superintendent. Well, thank you, Ms. Ebert, uh, for listening and engaging with our community members. We're gonna have a staff member take you to the next meeting room. We'll take that two minute break again and submit questions for the audience as well.
Okay. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome to the Superintendent Search Focus Group. My name is Michelle Anderson, and I am the Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer, and will be serving as the moderator for this focus group. We appreciate all of you taking the time to participate in this focus group. At this event tonight, you'll note that we are providing a space for our students, family, staff, and community members to get to know the candidates in person and ask them questions. Your input is critical to helping the trustees select the best candidate for superintendent of our schools. As you know, there are five finalists for the superintendent position, all of whom who have been vetted and narrowed down by the board's appointed search, for, search firm, the Bryant Group, as well as search advisory group selected by the Bryant Group. This evening, you will meet each finalist. First, I'll do a brief introduction of the candidate, and then they will share more about themselves and their vision. At any time during this event, you can submit your questions using the card, and you can write your questions anytime and turn them into one of our district staff members in the back. We have also received questions submitted online before this event, so I'll select uh, questions to read at random and alternate between the online and in-person submissions. We will try to get to as many questions as possible, but please remember we will be limited on time and we will not be able to get to all questions. Again, I will read the questions to the candidate. At any point in the evening or as you meet candidates, we invite you to complete the online superintendent candidate evaluation survey, which you can find in the back, and they have a QR code. We have handouts available. The survey will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, April 22nd. Information from this evaluation survey will be provided to the board in advance of their selection decision at the board meeting on April 26th. After 30 minutes in this room, the candidate will move on to the next room and will bring in the next candidate. Again, same process. Uh, so the, with me right now, I have Dr. Sean Loescher, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer uh, for Urban Discovery Schools in San Diego, California. Welcome. And if you would just say, take about two minutes just to introduce yourself and then we'll start with questions. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, welcome tonight. I'm wonderful to see everybody that has come out. I opened the evening uh, in my favorite way, which was with talking with your students and to have a deep conversation with them and to take notes of some of their questions, some of which I uh, could answer, some of which prompted more questions from me uh, than I was able to respond to. So uh, I had that followed by talking with some of our family members and I'm pleased to be in this forum now. Uh, so as already stated, uh, my name is Sean Lozier. I am uh, the Chief Executive Officer Officer, Urban Discovery Schools, San Diego, California. Uh, I also work in a couple of other functions uh, that I'm privileged to be able to, to work on, including uh, I continue to be a professor of doctoral studies at Arizona State University, where I teach principals and superintendents about complex matters in education, including uh, matters around critical theories and other items that impact schools. Uh, I also work uh, doing TED speaking for the TED Corporation, where in 2019 I was one of the 16 worldwide uh, awardees of one of the most innovative educators in the world. And what they have me do is go to different places and work with different educational organizations on what can be different, done differently in education for a community. Uh, I do have over 30 years educational experience in a variety of roles. Uh, I started my educational career as an instructional aide right out of school. So I started as classified member and deeply respect our classified members and what they do in, in our classrooms and in our school sites and how they ensure that we have all of the needs met uh, to make teaching and learning possible in our classrooms. Uh, I did eventually end up in a teaching role. I have also been a professor and uh, I've been a school site administrator and a district uh, director with looking at over 67 schools and uh, been an executive director and chief uh, of school district and uh, serve in, in my current capacity. Uh, so that's a little bit about my professional experience and I'll keep that brief, but I also am a parent of four children. Uh, I have a child in elementary school in third grade, I have a child in middle school eighth grade, and I have a child in 10th grade. Uh, and I have a, uh, I have a, I don't know how to describe this without my daughter being a, upset, but I'll do my best for her sake. I have a college, college, uh, COVID college goer where she stopped going uh, because there was nothing to go to. Uh, and she had called and said, you know, I'm not sure what I'm paying for. And I said, well, you're, you're not paying for it. Uh, I am, so I might need to be asking the question. Um, but she does uh, plan to re-enroll next year now that there are some options for her. But the online format wasn't working for her, and I did support her in that decision. And I continue to support her through that decision. Uh, the final thing to share uh, in that 
and some of the areas that I have some focus is uh, I do have a child with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and autism that is a 10th grader. So you will hear me speak quite passionately about a number of subjects around inclusion, about what students can achieve, and the importance of educational and edu educators belief systems, which is what a great deal of my research is about, about how that impacts student achievement and that we have to be able as educators in a community to believe that our students can do something because they can feel that. And in that belief system, it is the single greatest indicator of student success long term. And that is a plethora of research on that topic. So that's a little bit about my background and experiences. And uh, I may share a bit more depending upon the question uh, at hand. OK, let's start with the first one. Why do you want to be the next superintendent of the Washoe County School District? I've gotten this one in several forums. And, and uh, I don't mean to, to sound like an administrative politician, but I will go ahead and do that. Um, why wouldn't I want to be? I, I come from San Diego, California. And I think any place that you're from, sometimes uh, we don't see all the opportunities around us. People come visit San Diego, they talk to me about all the beautiful things that are there. I don't notice them. I don't go to the beach. I don't go to Balboa Park. I rarely go to SeaWorld. I, I, it's just my day-to-day -day life. Um, Washoe is a place of tremendous promise and opportunity. Uh, we're here at the base of the Sierra Nevadas in beautiful country. There is a wonderful balance of work and life and options that are there. Where the community is at in terms of economic development, for me, appears to be at a turning point. There are specific challenges that I'm passionate about, including some of the challenges that pertain to economic development in your region. I was sharing with some of the trustees that you know, when we look across the challenges that are ahead of us, your median home price has increased dramatically, but pay scales have not kept pace with those. And making sure that people have livable wage jobs is really something that's wholeheartedly important to me. So that way, they can enjoy life to the fullest. I also think that Washoe County Schools, it represents an ideal size of a school district where you have an economy of scale where things can be done, but it's not so large that we necessarily can get all caught up in just dialogue and not necessarily taking action. So when I reviewed Washoe and what was here, I reviewed a place where we could achieve a great deal together about the future of education. But why that's important to me is it's about the future of our students and our children, and that's the future of our country. Hands down, end of story. And so I, I looked at those things and thought that this would be a place that would be a, a place that was ripe with opportunity, which was my opening statement uh, that, that was given to the communications department. Beyond that, um, this is not the first time I've looked at Washoe schools. I want to be clear about that. I did, I did look. There was a process about four and a half years ago. And I looked at that time, but it didn't feel like the right time for my family. Um, I had just moved back from another assignment and uh, had had a, a really honest conversation about, with my family, specifically with my wife, about the type of effort that I would want to put forward into a position like this. And we didn't feel it was the right time. And I'm not going to do anything w without the full partnership of my wife and my family. That's just not something that will happen because I need to be able to know I'm going to have their support while I'm dedicating to myself to this task. So it's not the first time I've looked. Um, it is the, the time I chose to apply. And I'm thrilled with the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Uh, next question. Will you ensure CRT will not be indoctrinated to our students? Will you not take political sides? Sure. I want to be transparent about this. I'm a professor of critical theories, including critical race theory. I don't know of any place in K-12 education that's teaching critical race theory. It's an advanced legal theory. It's an advanced legal theory that is one that is studied at master's degrees or higher level. It was developed in the 1970s. And it was developed in response to the civil rights movement having stalled and looking at what policies or laws or procedures might be in place that might get in the way of people being able to achieve a more just future for their family. I have used critical race theory and critical policy analysis to look at district policies in order to see what barriers might be in place for our students that need to be removed so they can be a success. Those are all true things. I don't know any place teaching critical race theory in K through 12 education. I just don't. And if you have achieved it, 
then I want to be able to see it because I don't know of any other place that has been able to do it. Now, if we're having a different conversation, if we're having a conversation that we think that critical race theory and saying we don't want CRT means we shouldn't be talking about difficult topics, no, I'm not on board. We need to be able to talk about racism, sexism, and the things that are very real in our communities that are impacting our students. And we have to have a conversation about them, even if they're controversial at times, for a few reasons. I'm going to give an example one. Example one is, Sex education was highly controversial for a long time, but implementing sex, sex education and human reproductive education and having that conversation has reduced teen pregnancies to the lowest levels in our nation's history. Avoiding the conversation isn't making it better. Having a respectful forum that's well thought out and creating an adequate space for it is what makes progress. And that's what I've been dedicated to for a very long time now. Now, I can understand there can be some controversy around that. I think we have to be able to be civil and respectful about it and talk about things in broader scopes. For example, anybody can look up my record on any number of things. I have implemented transgender rights. That is absolutely true. And I'll tell you why I've done it. It's about child suicide. Transgender students have the highest rate of suicide in this country. And we have to all be on board on saying that we are not OK with child suicide, not at epidemic levels that we've seen in this country. In order to address that, we need to address that we have children in need that do not have the voice, choice, or vocabulary to express what is happening to them. And we have to be able to work through that process. So be specific. I don't know where they're teaching CRT and K-12 education. I've heard the dialogue and the conversation, but it's just not happening. Talking about racism, yes, that needs to happen. Talking about what has happened in the world, talking about what's happening in various parts of the world and our country is the only way we're going to be able to come together in civil discourse to build a more just and ardent society for our children. And I'm firmly committed to that. And if you're in opposition to that, I'm happy to talk with you about it, because I want to convince you that we're right. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you believe all WCSD curriculum for grades K through 12 should be posted for parents to review? If yes, why? If no, why? Um, I find as an educator the term curriculum to be so convoluted, I'm not sure what anybody means anymore. If we're talking about books, yeah, textbooks should be able to be reviewed by the public, absolutely. If we're talking about curriculum as our da teacher's daily lesson plan, no. Teacher's daily lesson plans represent the equivalent of a battle plan. The moment you go into the classroom, everything changes anyways. And we need to make sure that our teachers are able to have a process whereby they can do what I did when I was in my classroom, which was to review what worked, what didn't work, and what I was going to improve upon in the future without having that be something that is simply being put out there on an ongoing basis. So if we're talking about that, no, I'm, I'm not there. If we're talking about pacing guides and what's there, well, first of all, I'm a public servant. I don't know where that term sits locally. I take pride in that. Uh, where I'm from, the public uh, administration building has a inscription on it that says public service is in the highest good. And I term, truly believe in that. So I take that badge as teacher as a big one, and that term as public servant is a huge one. As a public servant, for the materials that we develop, those are the property of the taxpayers of the state of Nevada, and they should be able to be shared if for no other reason that if what we are doing here is so special that every child should be able to benefit from it from everywhere else. And if somewhere else they're doing something that is so incredibly special that they're finding results, we should have access to it as well. We shouldn't have to redevelop it. So at that level, I'm on board, but not on the day-to-day -day practices of teachers in our classroom. They need to be able to have that as part of their ongoing professional practice. OK. Uh, you stated in your TED-Ed educator talk that we need to engage in innovations that may blur our very traditional concepts 
and notions of what schools are in a broader discussion of redesigning schools towards human-centered social service centers. Are you looking to transform WCSD into a human-centered social service center, and what does that look like? So um, whenever possible, <clears throat> when asked a yes or no question, I'll answer it. The answer is yes, I am. Uh, I have sought that in a variety of districts that I've been working with. What I mean by human-centered is, first of all, that we took a look at the entire ecosystem of the school district and the school, that we don't look at it from a singular point of view. By that I mean we don't look at it just through the eyes of people that work in the district or just in the eyes of the community members around the district or just in the eyes of the business community or just in the eyes from the parents or just from the eyes of the board seats that we look across the spectrum of different ways that things are impacting now by human centered what i mean is moving out of a process of applying systems that oftentimes would be appropriate in other settings if I'm talking about a business sending and I'm running an information technology company, I'm probably using a Lean Six Sigma system with statistical analysis and different ways to look at processes. Okay, that's appropriate to that. But when we're talking about children and communities and society, we have to have a way of looking at the very real impacts that we're making to our children and everybody that's touching that organization. When I talk about blurring the lines of what is offered, what I'm talking about is understanding what children experience on a day-in, day-out basis and what we need to do in order to provide the supports they require in order to learn. If you are hungry, it's hard to learn. If you have cavities because you don't have access to dental services, it is next to impossible to learn when the pain has become dull in the back of your head and you don't even realize that you can't concentrate anymore. If you can't read because you can't see the book or the board, we need to do something about that. If we have mental health issues, either born of the pandemic or in general around student depression, we have got to address that. And when I say we have to blur the lines, there is one place I know of where all children gather, and that's at school. And there are a lot of barriers that families encounter, and where we can rip down those boundaries, I, th I think we ought to. So that way, if the boundary is transportation, they don't have to worry about that. If the boundary, if the, if the boundary is something else, if we can remove it, then let's blur those lines. Absolutely. Let's look at what we can do together to partner and see how we can work differently in every aspect of our schools. Because there are no other places that I'm aware of that they go where all of those things can intersect on an ongoing basis. So that is what I meant, and uh, I meant what I said. Thank you. How would you plan to reduce the achievement gap between our English learners and native English speaking students? Thank you. Um, also for the person that submitted the previous question, thank you for watching my TED talk. That was very kind of you. Um, regarding uh, the first topic that, that's at hand, um, I would like to start with a nuance. Um, I, I have a doctorate and I'm still an English language learner. So for about 20 years now, I, I've not really understood the term too deeply. Uh, in my school systems, we refer to students as being in various status of being emergent bilingual. Uh, we find that that is a nuance of language that some people say, why would you choose that? Well, first of all, we want to choose, or we have chosen to choose, to honor a family's culture if it is of a lingual basis other than English. Second, we choose to do that because a lot of times we say things to our community and the things that we say, we base on being in the English language but aren't necessarily true in the long term. For example, we tell people that you need to read to your children at home. We see a lot of people that come back and say, but we don't speak English as a primary language at home. The research doesn't say you have to read to them in English. The research says model the behavior it's the behavior modeling that matters. And that you're, you're teaching your children that reading is an essential function and a process for learning and that they should regularly engage in it. That's what's important and will translate down the road. So I know that's a nuance, but in order to start a process of closing the achievement gap, we can start by honoring the skill set that's in place and then supporting a system that allows 
for both parents and students to move through a process of learning a second language. Now, I refer to it as being an emergent bilingual process. By that, mean, I mean, I ideally want to see students either be able to speak two languages across the board or, and this is gonna sound off the wall a bit and I'll explain myself, or be able to proficiently play a musical instrument and read music. Now, why would I say that? Why is it, well, both would be ideal, but if, if they could achieve either one, both would qualify for that student for a status called polyglot, and I'm gonna break that down. It basically means you can process information in more than one way, and that's not necessarily all that important to you at 18, but uh, when you hit 50, this little thing called neuroplasticity comes into play, and that's your ability for your brain to be resilient beyond the age 50. And polyglots are amazing in terms of having neuroplasticity. So a lot of that is, do we want to learn about other cultures? Absolutely. What a great way to learn about other cultures through music and through language in different ways and exploring that and honoring that. But also, we, we, we hope everybody is, is going to hit 50 and older, and we want to make sure that they're prepared for that stage in their life as well. So great. That, is, that is some of the ways to do. Thank you. What will you do to lead the district in significantly, significantly, excuse me, improving the early literacy skills of children so they are reading at grade level by the end of third grade? Uh, but early literacy is a passion of mine. It's a passion of a lot of people. And there's a lot of good reasons for it. Uh, an earlier question referenced my, my TED talk. And uh, the title of the TED Talk is Embrace Ambiguity, Why Predictive Metrics Aren't Working. Um, we have a thing that we do in education that's really dangerous. And that thing is called predicting your child's future before they've actually had a chance to engage in that future. And the third grade level is one that's cited a lot. And what a lot of research will tell you is that if a child is not reading at proficiency by grade level three, they, they are less likely to graduate high school. And there's a rightful need to look at early childhood literacy. Early childhood literacy, though, is part of what's called the vicious cycle of education. And this is another predictive cycle. And I'm going to answer the question shortly, but I'm just teeing it up. The vicious cycle of education is, is that the greatest predictor that your child is reading at grade level by grade three is that you read to your child for their first five years of life. The greatest predictor that you read to your child for the first five years of life is that you have a high school diploma. And the greatest predictor that you had a high school diploma is if you read at grade three. There are different ways to engage in early childhood literacy programs, but what I've come to find is, is that we put a bright, bright light on grades two and three and say, look at what's happening in grade three. What we need to be able to do is engage far before that in a community effort that promotes how do we go about what are healthy parenting literacy practices out of the gate and providing families for that. Because I don't know parents that want to not do the right thing for their kids. I know some that don't know what to do. I, I, I'm, I'm one of those, I've, I've learned things by being a parent. And I wish I had a tighter knit community group at some times to help me out. So the first step is looking at how we can partner to push down and be able to get those messages out into community. And again, an accurate message. Not that you must read to your child in English. Read to your child in whatever that language is. Read to them. Model the behavior early, often. And then let's move through that process and continue to engage in appropriate level act, uh, active interventions and supports. Other ways that I've supported that is through what's called a reverse impact teacher system. Reverse impact teacher systems is having teachers that we call impact teachers. Typically, they are used in a way that they come in to provide literacy supports uh, for a select group of children. A reverse impact teacher system is a little different reverse impact teacher system, the impact teacher goes in and relieves the teacher who already knows the child very well to work 
on those small group instructions while the impact teacher takes the rest of the class and is able to also provide some feedback and support for the teacher through a process called instructional rounds, which we won't bore everybody with this evening, but it's a, a practice where teachers are engaging and talking a lot. It's an extension of what are called professional learning communities that you're already doing uh, now here. Great, thank you. Um, in your interview, you said class time should be used for social emotional support and perhaps have classes online reducing our carbon footprint with Zoom. Could you expand on this idea and how do you think families would like this idea? Sure. Forgive me, I have a little throat lozenge that I'm keeping on the side. Um, a great lesson that I hope we will take forward from the pandemic is one that I think we've lost sight of um, through a lot of different things, a lot of well-meaning things, and I, I don't want to demean those things. One of the things that we lost sight of as we moved into uh, No Child Left Behind is, is that the goal of education and educators is first and foremost about childhood development, adolescent development, and young adult adult development. That is our mission first and foremost, and that is a social emotional process of supporting them through that growth model. And if we don't do that, and then expect that the academics will somehow materialize and follow, then we're not providing the type of learning environments that our children need to experience a high level of success and be able to get through some of those critical stages. So when I talk about classroom time should be spent on social emotional learning, I don't mean just classroom time on social emotional learning. What I was speaking to specifically is that there are things within our teaching practice that are called procedural learning techniques. These are things that are essentially are learning sets of steps. That those are things that can be transferred to a different modality whether it be online learning or other things for students to be able to engage in, in order to open up more time in our classrooms to get deeper into topics, whether it be social emotional learning, design learning, or project based learning, or any number of topics. And that I believe that can be achieved in a fashion that is sustainable and scalable across a school district, and that it allows for students to do something else which is, first of all, for students that are ready to move forward on to items, that when they hear something, that it clicks for them, that they can move forward. But if it's this topic that a student's struggling with, many of our students, I being one of them growing up, don't feel comfortable raising our hands in the classroom and saying, I'm struggling with this. That we feel somehow inferior because we didn't get it out of the gate while we watch and other people's heads are not that you would be able to review that three or four or five times, however you need it, or get some online support and help. I'm not suggesting that what we experienced in the pandemic represents an ideal form of education. I don't think it was a reasonable request of our educational institutions that after hundreds of years of practice for school-based opportunities that they were going to perfect online school in six to 12 months. I don't think that's reasonable. I think educators worked hard, did their best, and in an instant had zero practice on which to base their teaching and learning on and had to adapt. And I think they should be applauded for it, and I will applaud my teachers for it. But what I also think is that we learned some things that were there that might have been counterintuitive before that can be applied now. For example, I was told as a child, and children are continued told in school, do not pass notes, which now are text messages. Online chat rooms during the pandemic, where students were able to interact with each other and teach and learn from each other, were phenomenal tools. And we learned something else in the pandemic, something that was counterintuitive. Clearly, when programs started to be moved out of schools, the level of bullying at school sites went down. What was thought would happen, right? What logically we thought would happen is that the level of online bullying would go up, and that did not happen. It didn't happen, and instead what happened was a lot of those vehicles became places for student discourse and interaction. Those are simple practices we can pick up and take with us. Things we can do right now, technology is already in place, takes no additional effort 
to advance student learning and to allow for those things to happen. So Dr. Losher, I was hoping we were going to have time for another question, so you've got about 30 seconds now to wrap up and say any closing comments. And the answer is C. <laughs> Always a good answer. Always choose C. Uh, so go ahead and take 30 seconds, just to, if there's anything you want to address the, the audience before sure. we leave. Uh, first of all, I want to extend my thanks to the Board of Trustees. I want to thank my thanks to, or extend my thanks to this community for coming out this evening. I would hope that uh, if I am selected as your superintendent, that this is the first of a series of meetings. What I'd ask everybody in this room to do is to pick up the phone and call five people and get five more people to come. So that way we can up the dialogue together. Our purpose in public education is to rally our collective community together, to come together for our students, and to be sure that we're preparing them for their future, not our past. Our job primarily has been for the last hundred years in public education is we've tried to perfect systems of the past. We tried to perfect the school system that didn't necessarily prepare us for what we needed. What we need to get in the business of doing together is designing schools that are preparing every child for their future, and that future is different than ours. When I graduated high school, I was assured, assured that I would have anywhere from three to five careers. Our students will have anywhere from 10 to 14 careers. And they need to be able to rapidly adapt and innovate to those new learning environments for several reasons. First of all, for their own economic security for their family. Second, to provide what is needed for the growing labor force and the changes that are yet ahead. And finally, to get into a place where they can lead us. The challenges of their lifetime are not going to be like ours. They're going to have to deal with some things that we only theoretically addressed. Okay, They're, I, I got to cut you off because I got to get the next yeah. candidate in here. You so got thank it. you very much. We'll have a staff member take you to the next room. Thank you kindly. Thank you so much. And we'll take the two minute break again. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay, we are live. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome again to the Superintendent Search Focus Group. Uh, for those that may come in or that are watching live, I'm Michelle Anderson, the Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer, serving as moderator. I won't go through, um, as I mentioned, everybody here, the entire um, opening. However, I will encourage anybody that is watching live or in here to fill out the survey that is online uh, for superintendent candidate evaluation. Uh, there's a QR code on the flyer and it's in the back. Um, we have handouts available. The survey will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, April 22nd. Information from this evaluation will be provided to the board in advance of their selection decision at the board meeting on April the 26th. Again, we have 30 minutes. I will do the same as I've been doing, rotating questions that we have prior received and ones that are in person here. Um, and with us uh, this evening, we have uh, Dr. Cheryl Hobbs. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Victory Educational Solutions in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, Dr. Hobbs, if you will take about uh, two minutes just to kind of introduce yourself and then we'll get right to those questions. Okay, good evening everyone. It's such an honor to be here with you. Um, I am an educator, right, at heart, and that's how I actually came into education. I started out as a clerk typist. This is going to really date me, right? <laughs> but I started out as a clerk typist, so I like to say that because I'm grassroots, right, and I really understand the process. I've been a secretary, and from there I actually advanced all the way to Macintosh director and also a graphic designer. So that's my my business background, right? So I bring all of that to the table as well as I opened up my first company, which was a book publishing company. And I opened it up because I saw a need for students to be able to increase their literacy rate. And I wanted to change that. So I partnered with Detroit Public Schools with my business to come in and um, give students an opportunity to be able to publish, write and publish their own book. And so that was to me my gateway there. And then I fell in love with teaching and learning, right? And when I fell in love with teaching and learning, I was endeavoring to make a difference, the greatest impact that I could, and how could I do that to become a teacher? Now, why did I start there? Because teaching is the foundation for learning, and you can't become a great leader, in my opinion, unless you've been a teacher. And so I was a teacher, and so I understand the work of a teacher, and then from there I became a principal. Now, that is not a traditional way, because typically you go from teacher to curriculum director or executive director or some other trail to get you to principalship. But I went directly there. And so from principalship, then I became a network leader, which is the equivalent of an assistant superintendent. And from there, I became an assistant superintendent of a smaller district. So I worked in a big district that had like 54,000 kids. As a network leader, I led 19 schools. 11 of those schools came off of the priority list. And from there, and that was the state's priority list, they were identified as failing schools. And so through PLCs, and I know that's something that you have here, I use PLCs with that work in collaboration with those principals to be able to move those schools off of that priority list. So I'm very thankful and proud of that work, right? It took all of us working together. So I'm really big on voice. It's not about one person. It's about the collective voice of others to be able to support what you're trying to accomplish. So from there, um, I became the assistant superintendent of a small district, which was wonderful. So I've got both of those backgrounds, large district district, small district, which is more of like a rural district. The Detroit Public Schools is an urban district. So bringing that together. And then from there, I became the senior vice president of a charter school company, right? So now I've got charter school company. And then I opened up my own business because I wanted to be able to support leaders to be able to help them to understand what real leadership is. There are more of you out there than it is of us up here, mm -hmm. right? Always. And so as a leader, that's very important to understand because you have to know how to work with people to listen to their voices and activate those voices that you hear by listening, learning, seeking knowledge, to understand and then listening again because you don't walk away thinking that you know everything but you embrace everyone to learn what you do know right and to support what we all should be doing together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then what I will say, because we obviously are streaming live, is I'm going to have you put the mic a little closer so that everybody in the audience and in the back can hear. Okay. Because um, I want to just make sure we're uh, projecting that voice. All so, right. Uh, let's start with our first question. Why do you want to be the next superintendent of the Washoe County School District? I love that question. I really do. And here's why. I really believe in teaching and learning. And when I think about Washoe co County, school district, I think about the work that you've already done, 
the progress that you've already made, and how I can work with you to support your furtherance and growth of that work. When I talked with your current sitting superintendent and I learned about the many initiatives that are aligned to what I've already done, I was like, wow, this is really good. So it helped to confirm how I could make an impact with taking what you've already done that you do well to also take the proficiency scores and help move that needle up because I've lived that through Detroit Public Schools. And I know what it's like, again, to be a teacher doing everything that you can possibly think of doing and still not being able to see those results. And to be able to help Washoe through the collective understanding of all of our voices together, working together to understand where do you see that work going from here to there? And how do we work together to accomplish our goals and dreams? To seeing how students can become proficient in our county. Excellent, thank you. Uh, will you ensure CRT will not be indoctrinated to our students? Will you not take political sides? Absolutely. So here's what I believe about uh, critical race theory. I always say this, and I've always said this to teachers. We only get in trouble when we move away from the curriculum and we start teaching opinion, we start teaching what everybody thinks and says, when we stay with the curriculum and we follow it as our guide, we don't get into trouble. But when we move away from that, that's when we get into trouble. So absolutely, I'm not a, I'm not a politician. So if you're looking to hire a politician, I would say look at the governor. I'm a teacher, <laughs> I'm a principal, I'm an executive leader, that's who I am. So no, I don't take sides. All right, thank you. How would you plan to reduce the achievement gap between our English learners and native English speaking students? So first I need to understand how the gap evolved, right? And again, the only way I can understand that is to have the conversation with the different area superintendents to be able to understand from their lens how it happened. Because again, it's not about me coming in and saying to you what you need because I don't know what you need. I always look at it like the physician. When you go to the doctor, the doctor looks at you and says, so what is your problem? What is it you have? You say, I've got this symptom, that symptom, right? So that's what I would do. I would come into the district as a superintendent and have those authentic conversations. What's ailing you? How do you feel? How did it happen? Why do you feel sick? Why do you feel this? And when you have those kind of conversations, then people begin to talk about it. And then you begin to have an understanding of how it happened and why it happened. Then together, because I believe in shared governance, see I don't just write things to say it, right? I, I believe in it, I live it. So when you have shared governance, then people share with you without being able to feel like they can't talk about what the elephant in the room is and they say what they feel and how they feel they got there. And then we talk about how together we can get out of it. And it takes all of us with our expert knowledge, because I believe that everybody at the table is reasonably intelligent. And I hope everybody is smarter than I am. And when you have that type of philosophy, then you'll grow and you'll work together and you'll make the changes that are necessary to fill the gap. Thank you. Uh, next question, do you believe all WCSD curriculum for grades K through 12 should be posted for parent review? If yes, why? If no, why? I believe in transparency. District transparency is key. Parents should not have to have a mystery of what it is that we're teaching and how kids are learning. You have to have full transparency. That's one of the things I love about the state of Michigan because they have what is called the transparency report. So when you go into any district website or any school, there's that transparency website. And so when we operate from a transparent perspective, then we are inviting people to know what we are, that we're, what we're doing, and that it's no mystery, it's no secret. And and then when we have parent involvement and we have them sit at the tables and decision making about curriculum, about whatever it is that we're trying to do, then there's that knowledge and growing of understanding of what we are all doing together. Again, we can't operate as a district and as a silo. It can't be, you know, Dr. Hobbs initiative or district offices uh, initiative. It has to be, this is what we all collectively talked about. And the board is supporting that and we're all working together to make sure the changes are happening. All right, thank you. Um, in the Pearson Math textbook, there is a graph stating that when measuring racial prejudice by political identification, conservatives are the most racist group. And Pearson's response was to stand by this statement. 
saying education is the most powerful force for equity and change in our world. Do you believe Washoe County School District should continue to support Pearson with this blatant bias? And they say, P.S., this is only one bias example from Pearson. So that's a very good question. And I'm not a politician. Again, I'm an educator, right? And so I'm not going to. At first, I have not evaluated and seen with my own eyes to be able to understand. So I would have to look at it for myself and then make a decision. Thank you. Uh, what will you do to lead the district in significantly improving the early literacy skills of children so they are reading at grade level by the end of third grade? So I would work with our early childhood teachers and I would begin to um, find out where they are in the trenches of the work that they're already doing. I believe that early childhood is the foundation of every district and of every community. If we grow that particular population of students at an early age, by the time they get to third grade, we're already looking at how well they're going to perform in terms of literacy and be able to see how that can increase. But we have to start with the foundation of that. Thank you. In Nevada, our Department of Education and Washoe County School District have chosen to focus on equity over education, which has resulted in high graduation rates, masking low proficiency rates, 47% proficient in English language arts and 23 in math, and equity using restorative practices creating unsafe schools. How will you uh, how will your continued focus on equity better prepare students to be college and or career ready? So I want all students to be able to earn a high school diploma and be able to read what that diploma says more than just their name that is on that diploma. When you ask me about the degrees that I have earned, I say that with the emphasis of earn because no one gave it to me. So we don't hand out diplomas to students. We help students to be able to understand how and ways that they have learned. And we do that through authentic portfolios. We do that through non-traditional means of how we assess students. You know, that's one of the things I think about state assessments countrywide is that we only look at it from one perspective. And the only variation are children with special needs. Why aren't we looking at the way that we evaluate student achievement from a different perspective? And that is, what is it that this child how are they learning and what are the evidences of that learning and the impactfulness of that and if that is not proven then how do they earn a diploma that would be my question thank you uh, what is the most important asset in an organization like this school district repeat your question please. sure uh, what is the most important asset in an organization like this school district the teachers human capital the teachers if we value humans as understanding their role and responsibility to make the impact, that's the only way we can move student achievement. That's the only way we can have a district that is solvent. When you think about the finances, right, it all impacts and rolls over. It's all of it working together in tandem. It can't be, again, just the kids, because without the teachers, we don't have kids. And without the kids, we don't need teachers. So we have to look at it all together. And so I would say it's definitely teachers and it's students. Thank you. Okay, next question. I want to know how the superintendent plans to make Washoe County schools better. I feel like education in Nevada is really lacking to keep kids motivated. Teachers aren't teaching standards. Uh, I'm sorry, teachers aren't teaching. Standards seem to be low compared to schools in other states. Kids need motivation to do well, to see the big picture. COVID really caused a lot of kids to lose their drive to do well. They feel like the world is going to end and school doesn't matter. How do we make school matter again? So we have to bring in creativity. We have to allow teachers to be creative in the classroom. We have to remove barriers that block that from happening. We have to be able to invite them to the table to be able to express how did we get here? Right? How did those concerns emerge? And then how do we stop it? So if it's something that's hemorrhaging, first you understand what is the blockage? What is happening? Why is this, why is this going on? And then from there, you can make those decisions as to what needs to take place next. 
So I can't directly answer that question because I'd have to evaluate it. I have to look at it really in-depthly to find out how did we get here, what's going on, and then how do we stop it. But it takes voice. It takes everybody having that conversation. Thank you. Why focus on demographically driven equity versus paying teachers more and decreasing class size? Do you believe teacher pay and smaller class sizes should be prioritized in the budget? Absolutely, because when teachers are stressed out, they can't teach their best way. They really can't. And what ends up happening is that they're exhausted, they're burned out, and then the students aren't learning. And so we have to make it a safe environment for teachers to be able to explore how their craft of teaching is so that they can advance the learning of their students. Great. This is my favorite question uh -oh. <laughs> uh, that somebody wrote I did not. Convince me you can get 8,000 staff to enthusiastically follow you uh, and with your past experience doing this. Oh, I like that. I like that question. And let me tell you why I like it. Because I'm embracing. I bring people together. I speak to the custodians. I speak to the bus drivers. I speak to everybody. That is important to me. I have watched leaders in district offices walk into a school as if they are here, as opposed to we are all right here. So that's the first way. You build trust. You build the compassion of who you are for them to understand that I'm here with you. Why did I take you on the journey of my past? So that you can understand that I really am one of everybody. Clerk typist. Thank you. Uh, as a superintendent, how would you describe your role in special education for the district? So I'm a special education provider, right? I have certification in special education. It is the heart of all students in education, right? And I believe that the same model of special education where we look at students individualistically can resonate through all students having a plan that is just like you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a diagnosis but he doesn't see all his patients at the same time and he doesn't give all of them the same prescription if he's a good doctor. They may have the same symptoms but guess what? We all have different sizes, we all have different preconditions and all of that and so all of that needs to be considered. So when we look at individualizing education that's what I bring to the table as a special education provider, that influence and understanding. Thank you. What are the two to three specific markers that truly job done? That's a very good question. What are the two or three markers that help to find out if the district is getting the job done? And I would start with morale. Because if people have low morale, morale. If people have low morale, they're not going to do the job. And when we allow them to feel validated and supported and have a voice to be able to express the conversations that they don't necessarily have an opportunity to address through that, then we're not going to be able to do that. So I would say definitely morale. I would say definitely looking at um, the teacher shortage. Right? but alternative ways to being able to change that. And so, like I said, into one of the other groups, we would be looking at how we could do maybe centralized uh, teachers where they're certified and they're able to deliver online instruction while we also have our paraprofessionals in the classroom to support and facilitate that. So learning is continuous and we don't have this gap and divide in education. Thank you. Do you think parents should be the ones to teach their children about sex, or do you think schools should? Oh, that's a very good question. It's like a hot topic, right? <laughs> I believe that parents reserve the right to teach their children what their, te their children need to know, right? Who is the first teacher for every child? It's the parent. Thank you. Uh, what is your position on teaching the arts in schools and at what school level should students start learning foreign languages? Students are first, so that's a really good question, I love it. Um, my grandchildren speak Spanish, right? And you know, I've talked to my kids, I have two kids that have kids, right? Um, about introducing even more languages. So the answer first is early childhood. See, I think we forget sometimes the ability of the human brain that we can learn anything. 
right? You can take a child and put them in any environment and immerse them into a culture of language and they'll pick up on it. We're talking about the human brain here. So no age is too early. You teach babies. If you start saying hola to a baby, the baby will eventually understand what hola means, just like they understand hello. So language starts from the beginning. Thank you. Um, who is your customer? Who is my customer? First of all, the customer are my students, <laughs> my teachers, my staff, and I work for the board if I'm the superintendent. Thank you. Uh, so I serve everybody. I'm a servant leader. That's my nature. <laughs> Uh, it says, do you believe that our children should be giving failing grades in grades 9 through 12 if you do consider or if you do feel kids should be given failing grades after all they have endured? Please explain why you feel this way. If you feel they should not be failed at this most critical juncture, please share your thoughts on that as well. So I believe that students should have an opportunity to present an authentic portfolio. And that authentic portfolio is a compilation of their work and the success that they have compilated together to bring into fruition that displays their knowledge in the best way. Not every child learns the same. We're all individual. And when I think about the way that we box children in to one scientific method, you get an A, you get a B, you get a C. We need to stop that. And so again, authentic portfolios is you bringing your best work. Now I'll give you a personal example. And I just shared that with the parent group. My grandson had a book report. Now he's a smart kid. But for some reason, the delay from his brain to writing out what he had learned in that book was hindering him. His mother, my daughter, her husband, they were challenging him, Mom, he just won't do his book report. Mom, huh, huh. I said, hold on a minute. Have you ever thought about interviewing him to have him talk about the book and you write down what he says? No, Mom, I never thought about that. Well, let's try that. So when I did it, I said, Brennan, let's talk about this story. And I asked him questions from what the teacher had given him, and I wrote it down. He was rattling off like that. You see, that's a non-traditional way. They would still be trying to get this kid to write it out. Now, he had to write what I wrote, but it was his words. So it's not like it's me. I said, now, are you sure you want to say this? Yeah, no, I, I like that. That's, that's what I want to say. OK, do we need to do any revisions? I took him through all the steps. Again, that's a non-conventional method. But guess what? He got an A on that book report. Had he been dealing with my daughter, her husband? <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, if any, plans do you have surrounding providing more established before and after school programs that are sponsored by the school district to ensure fair, accessible services for all students? First of all, we'd need to look at grants, and we'd have to also look at, you know, teacher service, right? Providing stipends for teachers, and we do that through, you know, writing grants to get the funds, because the district budget may not be able to accommodate that. And as we begin to um, open up that portal for people to say, you know what, I do want to help and work with summer school or after school, or I do want to help with Saturday school, there's a stipend involved, right? And there's professional development that's associated with that. So we, it's like when you get the grant funds to be able to do that, it really helps to support that extended learning opportunity for students. Thank you. Um, and I think we have time for one more and then we'll have you kind of wrap up your last little minute. Okay. Um, as a therapist in town and a mother, mental health is very important to me. Over the past couple of years, it has become more widely accepted that children's mental health is an issue that needs attention. If you become Washoe County School District Superintendent, what will you specifically do to address the mental health needs of all students in your district? So if I were the superintendent for Washoe, I would make sure that we look at the social emotional learning aspect of how we are working in the district, right? And what that looks like for students. 
and how we are addressing that and how we are working toward a solution to making sure that students who are coming to us in all different capacities that we're meeting their needs. But you have to do that by interviewing the student and talking to the student and finding out what are you thinking and how are you thinking and why are you thinking that. Suicide is real with kids. Whether we want to believe it or not, it's real and we never know what the difference of a kind word can be that takes that kid off of the cliff. So we have to have those conversations. And so SEL would definitely be something that I would look at to evaluate how and well it's working or not. I'm looking at my timer. It looks like we have another time for a little bit oh, more questions. should have been longer with that. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. I'm kidding. I'm, uh, kidding. I'm grabbing another question. We okay. have plenty. All right. What will you do to ensure that students that learn in different ways are represented? Oh, I love it because I'm a special education provider. And so I'm all about students being able to, again, I hope I've expressed that, you know, learning in different modalities. We don't have one way that should always be generated to this is how you learn. It should be how do you learn? How do you learn? And then we create a plan that supports your learning style. Teachers don't all teach the same and we shouldn't require them to all teach the same. So we have to differentiate instruction but to the next level. Not just as a buzzword that we've all learned to say, but the way that we practice it so that we make sure that I'm meeting the needs of each individual student. So what's wrong with each student having a plan? Thank you. Um, we're grabbing a random one too. Um, <laughs> Do you believe that public schools should be teaching or encouraging gender-based ideologies? Do you think these can be discussed in the classroom without informing parents? Again, when we stick with teaching and learning, the curriculum is what we're tasked to do. When we stick with that, we'll be our best selves as educators. We're not politicians. We are not, you know, parents to, you know, the children. We are educators and when we stay in our lane, and teach children what we are required by law to teach, then schools will be successful. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs. And now you have about a minute left to wrap up with any closing comments that you'd like for our audience. Okay, if you're looking for a traditional um, superintendent, I won't be that person, because I think out of the box. Right? I'm a person that um, explores new ideas and collaborates with people, works together with people, helps them to see how we all fit together to making the necessary changes that are in the best interest of us if I were your superintendent as a district. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs, and thank you for listening and engaging with our community members that we have with us and online tonight. Um, and we will have a staff member that's going to take you to the next meeting room, and we'll take a two-minute break in here. Okay, thank you. I'm honored to be with you. Thank you.
All right, well, go ahead. Do I, do I need to use this? Is this yes, important, you're, that's yeah, you're, important you're, for your filming? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let me, let me start out. On behalf of the Washoe uh, School Board of Trustees, welcome to our superintendent search focus group. My name is Michelle Anderson, and I'm the communication, chief communications and community engagement officer, and will be serving as the moderator for this group. Um, I won't go through the whole spiel for our, neighbor, or our, our, our uh, community members that are online, but I do want to stress again, um, at any point in the evening or as you meet candidates, we invite you to complete the online superintendent candidate evaluation survey. You can find the survey by scanning this QR code that's included in the flyer on the back. Uh, for those online, they can obviously go to the school district website. Um, we have handouts available. The survey will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, April 22nd. Information from this evaluation survey will be provided to the board in advance of their selection decision at the board meeting on April the 26th. So again, we have 30 minutes. Um, I will do the same thing that I've been doing um, this entire time, uh, rotating between the questions that we had people already um, email us and then the questions from uh, the community members in the audience tonight. Uh, so with us this evening, we have Dr. Caprice Young, who currently serves as the president of the Education Growth Group in Los Angeles. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, Dr. Young, just giving us about two minutes of your introduction and then and we'll go into the questions. Okay, well, I'm gonna change up my introduction a little bit because I see some familiar faces. Oh, I gotta be up here, okay. There we go. Now, that's, that, that, that does it. Um, well, my name is Dr. Caprice Young, and I am so excited to be here, and I'm really thrilled that you all came out to be part of this process. This is the, the most important decision that a school board makes is who their superintendent is going to be. And having the community engaged in that process is really, really important because your opinions will shape their, their decision. So thank you for taking your time to do this. Really appreciate you. Um, my background is that I was raised in Los Angeles. My mom is a special education teacher and a sculptor. Um, so I was raised in an, an, an art household where, um, where I was const constantly hearing from my mom about this student or that student or how she was changing it up to reach this other student. My father was a juvenile probation officer and became a minister. And so our house was kind of a very busy center of community because of all of that. Uh, but in addition, um, my, my biological parents were foster were foster parents. So I, uh, by the time I went off to college, I had 36 brothers and sisters of every different kind of background you can imagine. And um, I didn't really think that was a big deal at the time, but as I've, as I've become an adult, I've realized that it, it really influenced the way I think about the world in, um, in deep ways. Um, first is that I bond super fast. Because when you have foster brothers and sisters, you don't know if you're gonna have them um, in your family for a weekend or a year. And so um, I learned to bond really fast. And it, it also means that I, I love people, uh, hence being the extrovert, um, but all different kinds of people. And, and in addition to that, I, I also witnessed how systems failed my brothers and sisters. And, and I, I watched um, adults in the, in the system struggle, struggle to keep the safety net for my foster brothers and sisters knit, knitted together. And so it, it really made it so that I care tremendously about that safety net. And, um, and, and the safety net is really not about catching them when they fall, it's about how do we as a community all together ensure that they have the resources and the opportunities and the support that they need even when their family situation isn't what it could or should be. Um, because we live in a world now where family structures are very strained because of all the pressures that are put on our families. And so that's what I've dedicated my life to. Um, and in the first part of my life, it was more as my avocation, um, being um, a volunteer uh, and president of a board for a home for abused and neglected kids while I had a career in finance and technology. But after a stint on the Los Angeles School Board, I rededicated myself to education, 
at the beginning. I was a teacher for a year. Um, but I rededicated myself to education, and since, uh, and since 1999, I have been full-time in education from lots of different angles. So I have led um, philanthropic organizations focused on education. I led a teacher development program focusing on recruiting people out of uh, engineering and accounting and um, professional careers to become STEM high school teachers and then training them to be successful in that. And I've been superintendent of three um, school systems, one for 4,000 kids in 10 schools, one for 4,500 kids in 17 schools, and then most recently a network of 85 schools serving 49,000 um, formerly disengaged students. Some people call them dropouts or at risk. Um, my experience was that they were often kids who life, life just happened and they, needed, and they needed something different. And it was my pleasure to be able to lead the organization that served them. So that's, and, and I uh, and I'm, have an awesome husband and three girls, the youngest of whom is graduating from college next month. So yay, <laughs> yay. <laughs> I'm going boldly into empty nesting. So, probably TMI. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with the first question. Why do you want to be the next superintendent of the Washoe County School District? So for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but um, I have been working over the last 15, 15 years uh, to make myself qualified to be the superintendent of a traditional school district. And so um, in October, I, uh, I transitioned out of my uh, role as the National Superintendent of Learn for Life, part, uh, mainly because I knew that going through the superintendent search process was going to require a lot of my time and effort, but also that it's not always confidential. And so it would be um, tough, really awkward, to be a national superintendent of an organization at the same time as seeking superintendencies. Um, and um, so, so in general, I have wanted to become a superintendent of a traditional school system for quite a while. And, um, and I only have applied to, um, to superintendencies that meet really three criteria. Um, one is that they have a school board that is absolutely passionate about doing great work for the students. And, um, and you sure have that here in Washoe. Very dedicated group of board members. The next, a place where I felt like I could be really needed, where, um, where you don't just need, just isn't the right way to say it, um, where, where you need a superintendent that has experience in instruction and curriculum and also logistics and operations and technology and finance and human and human resources because I bring that that tool belt to the table and and in Washoe here you you really need a superintendent that has that very diverse um, framework of expertise the the teachers can't teach if the bus drivers can't get the kids to the school right and and I, and I know I can be helpful. And the, the third part of my criteria was it had to be some place that my husband would want to move. <laughs> and, and we've got cousins in Washoe, and uh, they've been telling us for a long time, this is a great community, you have to come here. And so I'm very hopeful that I'll be able to join them. Thank you. Uh, so question, uh, next question is, will you ensure CRT will not be indoctrinated to our students? Will you not take political sides? I don't think it's appropriate for the superintendent to take political sides on anything. I have been watching and seeing the C CRT debates, not just in Washoe, but nationally. And w what I often see is that um, people who are concerned about CRT, first of all, are using CRT as a, a reference for something that actually isn't CRT, because I am absolutely certain CRT is not being taught in the Washoe schools, because CRT is something that is taught in very specific, narrow, graduate level programs. Um, and that that's not what's happening in any of our schools. The, the parents with whom I've spoken 
um, who are concerned about what they call CRT are more concerned usually about um, about their students, their kids being taught that because of their ethnicity or the you know the color of their skin, that that they are bad, right? That they they must be racist because they're a particular ethnicity, and that's not being taught in the schools either. Um, and I think it's important for us to reassure parents that that is not what we're teaching, right? What we're what we're teaching um, is about how do we make sure that all students know how to get along with each other? We live in an incredibly diverse world, right? And part of that is learning the backgrounds of your peers and where they come from. And for a lot of students, it's also not just learning about the backgrounds of their peers, but their own background. And I think that is really important and really strong. And when people talk about the CRT debate, it's, it's usually code for, I don't want you to make my kid feel bad because of whatever their background is. And as a superintendent, it would always be my goal to ensure that we have unconditional education. And what that means is that we educate every single kid embracing who each is individually. Thank you. Sure. Uh, how would you plan to reduce the achievement gap between our English learners and native English speaking students? Well, you need, you have to have different strategies to educate English learners. I've, I've done a lot of educating English learners in the, the, the schools that, that I've led, and, and a big part of it is using um, educational strategies that are specific to English English learners and those those programs are known programs and we can and we can focus on that together to make sure that the schools are um, are providing very explicit education for those students to learn English and not just to learn um, the sort of the phonemic uh, piece of English but also to have it be um, comprehensive and understand how to comprehend English so that they can use it in their day-to-day -day, day -day education. And as long as the um, education that English learners are being provided is differentiated and rigorous, then they'll be successful. Where I have seen schools and school districts fail in educating English learners is uh, when they try to make things easier so that they'll pass instead of focusing on actually educating the students. And I'd be willing to bet you have an awful lot of folks here who are very good at that, and it's really a matter of sharing their ideas and their resources to be able to be more successful. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you believe all WCSD curriculum for grades K through 12 should be posted for parent review? If yes, why? If no, why? Well, absolutely, um, and um, and in in a lot of places, let me let me say the first reason why. Um, so first of all, in um, in curriculum adoption processes, there is usually, and I have seen it in the board notes here, there is a process for community engagement in the selection of the curriculum in the first place, right? The the next is yes, absolutely, the core curriculum needs to be um, needs to be posted and available. Um, also, the textbooks need to be available, not just in the schools, but in public libraries. So if a parent wants to go and say, look at the fourth grade textbook for a particular subject, they can. And it's especially important for parents to be able to have access to the curriculum because they're the ones that are supporting their students' learning at home. So I think it's more than just them having access to it, especially at the elementary school level, it's important to be able to incorporate what is in the curriculum in your parent universities so that they can be supportive of their child's education. Thank you. Um, what will you do to lead the district in significantly improving the early literacy skills of children so they are reading at grade level by the end of third grade? Yeah. So I think one of the most important things that we can do um, is to make sure that all of our teachers are, are getting the very best training in early literacy. Um, and they are taught um, how to teach phonemic awareness um, and direct instruction 
as well as incorporating rich literature into the classroom experience. Those are both really important because you want kids to learn to decode the words and you want them to learn to love reading, right? And, and a lot of that really does come down to um, making sure the teachers have the training that they need. And, um, and I would absolutely support making sure that the teachers have the, the training and the curriculum that they need to be successful. There's another piece to that though, right? We've just gone through two years of students not getting what they need. So we're going to have to take a look, not just at students learning to read completely by third grade, but we're gonna have to take a look at the third graders now who, who in kindergarten, first and second grade, had uh, had learning loss, or it's not really learning loss, it's that they just didn't get enough support in the last two years. And so we have to think about expanding our um, our instruction for, for reading into later grades. Um, the schools that I've led have often had students that would come in, for example, um, when they're 17, reading at the fifth grade level. And so we have to think about literacy, not just in K-1-2, we also have to think about literacy and comprehension all the way through because if we only fix it for K-1-2, then we've got three through 12 that may not be where we need them to be either. So we have to think about literacy all the way through. And it's different at different stages of development. And there are fortunately wonderful programs um, that I've implemented for some of the older years too. So programs like Read 180 and Achieve 3000 um, and, um, and others that are, that are fabulous. And probably I'd be willing to bet you've got some of them already here and it might be a matter of making sure that the students who need those programs are connected up to them. Great, thank you. In Nevada, our Department of Education and Washoe County School District have chosen to focus on equity over education, which has resulted in high graduation rates, masking low proficiency rates, 47% proficiency in English language arts, and 23 in math, and equity using restorative practices creating unsafe schools. How will your continued focus on equity better prepare students to be college and or career ready? Well, I think the basic definition of equity is actually academic success, right? I mean, if if we're not if we're not focused on making sure that every student is gaining the proficiency and the excellence that they need, that's not equity. That's not doing anybody any favors. Um, and so, I think it's a false a false trade-off, right? It's not that it's academics or equity. It's that if you don't do the academics, you're not doing the equity. And it's also true that unless you're creating a welcoming learning environment, students are not going to learn. And um, the efforts around restorative practices, a lot of that is not just about how you handle discipline. It's also about how do you create a community of caring where young people feel safe enough, safe enough to fail, honestly safe enough to make mistakes so that they can learn. Because one of the main ways that we learn is by making a mistake and then, and then taking, taking a, a shot at doing it better. So, so we have to do both. We can't, we can't do equity or academics. We can't do discipline or, um, or restorative practices. What we have to do is focus on, not buzzwords, but focus on how do we create communities of caring and a welcoming environment with a, with a strong focus on ensuring academic excellence. Thank you. Okay, next question. Convince me you can get 8,000 staff to enthusiastically follow you um, and highlight your past experience doing this. So not gonna happen. They're, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna be, they're gonna be 2,000 of them that are like, yeah, let's go, right? And then, and then they're gonna be 5,000 of them that were like, yeah, okay, that sounds all right. Well, yeah, we're, we're up for it. And then they're gonna be 1,000 that are like, no, this is terrible, but I guess we have to. Right, and, and, that, and that is kind of the way, <laughs> the way it works. You don't get 8,000 people to do that uh, very often. 
but but what I will tell you though is that I have had success getting a lot of people to to row in the same direction, and the, I think the key to it is first making sure they're involved in the setting of the direction in the first place, right? I mean, that's, that's absolutely vital. And then the next is making sure that, um, that the direction is tied to the why, right? It's tied to purpose. Um, and, and that people are brought into that purpose and inspired by that purpose. And then also that the strategy that you put in place actually makes sense towards achieving that purpose. And that and that is um, that's the formula for getting that to work. And it, it really starts with engaging engaging the humans themselves. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Do you believe our students should be taught America is a white supremacist nation and do you believe in white privilege? If so, what does that mean to you? Wow. So I know, I know that I have a different experience um, when I walk when I walk uh, through the park um, or into or into any environment than my brothers and sisters, who are my foster brothers and sisters of color, do. Um, and so. I guess the, the answer is yes, I believe in white privilege because I have experienced it. Like, I know that when I walk into a room that the, the first thing people are thinking is not, is this, is this person um, a criminal? Or is this person, you pick the stereotype. Um, and, and that benefit of the doubt is a privilege. And it has allowed me to, to walk through the world with a lower level of stress than my brothers and sisters have. And I think that um, we have to recognize that. And in, in recognizing that, it gives us the opportunity to all come together around solving it, right? And, and I, I think that's a good thing. I think that this is a conversation that is a super hard conversation. And and it's not ever going to be an easy conversation. And sometimes being uncomfortable is just part of growing. I mean, when you think about when you're working hard in the classroom, for example, as a student, um, there is sweat and perspiration that goes into learning. Well, and as a community, we have to have some difficult conversations and they're gonna be uncomfortable. Um, and that's okay. Because on the other end of it is gonna be something great. Right, and that and that greatness is going to be that our students are all going to be able to be successful, because we because we value them. Thank you. Uh, what is the most important asset in an organization like this school district? Oh well, this, I have to answer this the same way it was asked before. Cause I had the exact same question, and um, the the most important asset is the kids, right? Um, and they they are not the done too. They have to be they have to be part of part of the everything, right? I mean, any teacher will tell you that when when the kids are up for learning, they're going to learn a lot more. And when they have agency and engagement around their learning, they are an asset to the whole organization in terms of their progress, right? And um, and teachers are absolutely vital that and what I have seen nationally and in my own schools has been absolute heroism in the classroom. Our teachers heroes and heroines and have done phenomenal work um, and unfortunately have not gotten the thanks that they should have and you know I think in, in Russia we're gonna have to really we're gonna have to really thank them more right and and I also want to recognize the fact that um, that even though the students are the most important asset and the teachers are the ones with them every single day, that an organization isn't just one asset or another. As we've all learned, it, if, if the bus drivers can't get the kids into the classroom, um, you're worried about that asset too, right? And it has been my experience also that the office managers are some of the most important people in schools because they're the ones that are kind of running the place 
And so to for, for us to say, well, this asset's more important than that, that uh, that's just in, in gender's division. And the fact is what we really want to be do is pulling in the same direction. Thank you. Um, Next question, as a superintendent, how would you describe your role in special education for the district? As chief champion, chief champion for special education. Um, I'm a special ed mom, and, um, and also I have educated kids in schools where we've had 40% of our kids special ed. And um, one of the biggest challenges that we face nationally, but we face right here in Washoe too, is that we don't have enough special education teachers. If I could clone my mom thousands of times, I would. Um, she was a special ed teacher, um, but we really, but we really do have to work much, much harder with the schools of education to get more special ed teachers, um, and and also, frankly, to support our teachers who are already credentialed, but who are willing to. Um, to expand their skill sets in special ed because it's a huge need. And so my role as a superintendent is would be to be champion in chief for special ed. And what that looks like in terms of how do you get it done is elevating the status of special ed teachers, but also working with community partners and universities to be able to expand our work in special ed and increase the workforce. Thank you. Uh, do you think parents should be the ones to teach their children about sex, or do you think the school should? Well, that's awfully broad, right? Because there are basic things that kids need to know. And some parents teach them, and some parents don't. And that, that is where um, there has to be input from parents about what what they would like to see. There has to be input from um, from educators about what is developmentally appropriate at different ages. There also needs to be input from healthcare professionals to make sure that what's being taught is, is accurate, um, but also appropriate. And and ultimately, that that is the decision of the school board representing all of their constituents. and. I would hope that as superintendent, I would be able to be fully engaged in that process so that we can find the right, the right balance for our community. Great, I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap it up here. Uh, what are the two to three specific markers that truly tell whether the district is getting the job done? So the, I think the, the, the first that we have to focus on right now is, um, is attendance. The kids have to be here in order to learn. And if being here might mean physically in the classroom, but it also might be co consistently logging in online and doing their work. But so the, the first is, are the, kids, are the kids coming and are they engaged? Right, and that's really, really important. Another, another uh, marker of whether or not we're getting the job done is, are they successful academically? Right, so, um, so yes, it's test scores, um, but it, it's also things like graduation rate and, um, and advancing from one grade to the next with the skill sets in place that they're gonna need as they're coming in. And really looking at, you know, not just the test scores, but also looking at are the kids progressing successfully and not waiting to just, well, are they graduating or not? We have to make sure that our fifth graders, for example, who are matriculating into middle school, have the skill sets that they need to be successful in middle school. And, and that, that is really an absolutely critical indicator. Great. And then you have a little less than a minute left uh, to give a wrap up, say any closing comments. Yeah, um, you know, I, I have had the best day it has been such a pleasure getting to meet, getting to meet people. Um, I especially have to say I, I, I love spending time with the young people that I got to meet, and it, um, it never leaves me how wise, how wise they are, even when they don't know it. <laughs> and um, the, the teenagers that I met at Reed, I asked them, uh, asked them, well, what, you know, what do you think is most needed to create an education system that's going to be successful for the kids 10 years from now. 
And then the thing that they said was their number one, their number one thing wasn't everybody has computers or, um, or something like that. It was, is there somebody who's an adult at school who's going to care whether or not I'm there? And oh my gosh, right? Right? And that's, that's what we have to get to. It's not, and, and that just sounds to me like such a low bar, you know? But that's what they said. And, um, and I want to make sure that, that that happens. But more than that, more than that, that they are encouraged to dream and also that they leave our schools with the skills and knowledge to make their dreams come true. And that is my wish for Washoe students. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to do a little bit of a different closing because obviously this is our last candidate. So thank you so much, Dr. Young, for being with us and engaging with our community members. Uh, thank you to all of our community members that are here in person and online. Uh, we appreciate your input and participation. We hope you found this forum inform informative and that you continue to engage in the superintendent search process. The recorded live stream link of this evening will be included on the website washaschools.net under the superintendent search page. The family and employee groups recording will be available online tomorrow afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, the five finalists will be interviewed during the board meeting, which starts at 9.30 a.m., and that meeting will be live streamed as well. Lastly, we invite you again to complete the online superintendent candidate evaluation survey. You can find the survey by scanning the, this QR code um, that we have on handouts, and then obviously uh, we will have on our website. The survey will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, April 22nd. Information from this evaluation survey will be provided to the board in advance of their selection decision at the board meeting on April 26. The information on all the candidates and the next steps can be found again on our website, washoschools.net, under the superintendent search, and that's right there on the front page. Thank you again, everybody, for your input and participation tonight. Thank you very much.